Great, great to be here. Um, Cal's my favourite mining town. And uh, great thanks to the sponsors for, for making this happen. The Ugang Craton, big picture, why it matters. So do you ever wonder why you're here? I mean, what I mean by why you're here, why you're here in Kalgoorlie and why is Kalgoorlie here as opposed to somewhere else like 10 or 20 kilometres away? It turns out that these giant deposits are focal points of large energy and mass flux systems that emanate deep in the mantle. They happen at global scales, at continental scales, at craton scales, at province scales, and they integrate across those scales with, in a very focused way that allows the energy and the mass flux to concentrate, in this case gold, in world-class quantities just, just behind us here. Generally, the larger and more energetic systems mean the bigger deposits like the super pit, which is a good thing for an explorer because the signals, the footprints, are generally larger. And so the tools that we're able to, 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 to use uh, allow us to identify these elements of the system. I guess one of the challenges, though, is we're often dealing with fuzzy things, things that are deeper and broad scale. We may not be able to uh, recognise the precise genetic links with the mineralisation, say, at the super pit. Nevertheless, these methods and, and, the, and the data sets and the approaches are, 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 are valid. And we all know exploration is a scale reduction or a volume reduction process. Going from the big scale, as I said, the sort of the continental, the, 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 the province, the crotons, into the district and all the way into the, uh, into the ore body. And this is a bit of work from Cam McQuaig, sort of illustrating this scale integration. We go from the broad regional, as I say, this is in kilometres, down to the deposit. And up on the x-axis, uh, sorry, y-axis, we've got a notion of effectiveness. And the two sort of parameters I'm going to look at is prediction and detection. So they're the two ways you go about exploration. You predict where you want to be, and you ultimately try and detect the deposit. It turns out, oh, this doesn't work, yep. At the broadest regional scales, we can say with quite good confidence that Yulgan's a pretty good place to be, Eastern Golfers is a good place to be. So we're on the left-hand side of that diagram, right? But as we get closer in, it gets the predictions become, particularly with the data sets we're using, become a little bit less effective. Although I'm going to argue a little bit of difference from Cam's uh, model here, and I'll come to that in a minute. But what you do as you come into an area, you're actually choosing your area you want to be in, you lose your flexibility. So that comes at a penalty. That's an opportunity cost of where you, you wouldn't be elsewhere. So you're spending your money. So you've got to get that decision right. And that's why the big, the big picture matters, because it gets you into the right place first and early. Right? The other way to identify your deposit is, of course, detection. Now, we can't go and patent drill or use IP across the whole Yulgan or across the whole Eastern Goldfields or, or Murchison or wherever you're working. But you can very effectively do detection, depending on your deposit type and your, your understanding of it, at those smaller scales. So it's really important that you get into the right place early and don't waste your money on the wrong place. Because it's costly. So the, the key here is to get to the right place quickly and minimise your cost for detection to make your drilling. What I find really interesting is this crossover between the prediction and detection. That's the most difficult space. It's when you're going from the geological survey sort of data at the broad regional scale, crossing over into the really detailed brownfields data that you guys in the mines have. Right? And, and trying to integrate across those is bloody hard. So trying to identify where the next camp is, particularly undercover, is a great challenge, and it's what the Project Gen te teams do all the time. So it's really important you understand the big picture and bring that into your thinking with your understanding of those deposits at the local scale and try and um, tease these, the, these aspects together. As I said, I disagree uh, with Cam on one aspect. I think structural geology is a really powerful tool. When you're in a deposit and you understand the kinematics of it, you can predict. You could drill data off drill straight off uh, um, a good understanding of the structural history. And I think we'll see examples of that from Brett later on. So, Yulgan 101, Archean 101. We're part of uh, a number of Archean cratons scattered around the world. Um, this is a, a famous one, the Yulgan, well, well understood, well studied, obviously in WA. The Yulgan itself, it's a big area. It's broken up into a number of or, uh, terrains and domains. Uh, this was work from <clears throat> Kevin Cassidy and authors. Now, we might argue about the boundaries of these um, and how these boundaries evolved. But nevertheless, we have a southwest terrain, a you and me terrain, a narrier terrain, 
This is sort of the older part of the, the eastern goldfields, at least, sorry, of the, of the Ugarn. We cross the Ida Fault and we go into the eastern goldfield super terrain, where we have the Kalgoorlie, Kanaupi, and Burtville. And then there are domains within there. Some of the ideas have evolved over the last 20, 30 years and even longer about whether these are uh, you know, separate entities that have been at different parts of different oceans and come together or whether it's one entity that's been rifted and, and brought back together. Consensus now, I think, believe, uh, I believe, is, is that it was largely intact and, and has seen some extension and con contraction and some movements in between. And that's what I would favour too. So we're near Archean. It's up to 2.5 billion years old and older. Granite greenstone terrains. These are highly mineralised, as we all know, in gold and nickel, but also many other goodies. And increasingly of great interest um, are the battery metals, the lithium and the rare earths. And of course, the food metal, um, potash, which has been recently discovered, which is fantastic. Now, we know that these aren't equally endowed. And I'll just show a picture, an old one from Francois, real rare. And we see the distribution of gold. You know, why have we got these patchy distributions. We know this is a, an enriched area, but it's not enriched equally. Now, is it just because we haven't looked well enough, or is that a real factor? Can we map the controlling structures that control the distribution of those, those major patterns? And yes, we can. I believe we can, and I'll show you some of those. We have some excellent data sets, commonly collected by the geological surveys and GA, but also academia, and fed in by, by, by industry. So we've got some fantastic data sets to work with. So in terms of the geology, so here's a big scene setter. Um, it's, it's granite dominated, about 70% of the area is, is, is granite and that's all the pink rocks that we see there. We've got these elongate greenstone belts, they're made up of volcanic rocks. They're generally uh, five kilometres thick or less, there's a few thicker ones, but generally of that order, so they don't go down too deep. We're looking at a felsic crust, so largely granitic crust, about 32 kilometres to around 45 kilometres. Thickening to the east, we see a sharp moho, so we've got a good sense of what this this, this crustal piece of crust is. And then the lithospheric mantle underneath that's around 200 k's thick, maybe 220. We see that the margins are all reworked, so the Yulgarn was likely to have been bigger um, and part of some other supercontinent in the past. And there's some interesting speculations about that. So let's look at some of those geological elements. Let's start with the, with, with the biggie, um, the granites. And this is, this is an old map from Champion, Dave Champion and John Sheraton, but there they define the main granite types. And we'll hear more from Hugh Smithies how, uh, this afternoon on how the, the ideas have evolved. But fundamentally, this is still true. We have these, what they call the high calcium granites. They make up about 60% of the granites. They're the pinks and the reds on that map. These are high pressure melts. So they've come from deep down, 60 kilometers plus. He will probably tell us what those numbers are. They're tonalite, trondramite, granodiorites, TTGs, bit of jargon, but that's what they call them. They make up about 60%. The other class is the low calcium granites. These are melts of previous crust. They tend to be shallower melts. Um, they occur late in the piece. They are reflecting the cratonization, the losing of heat from the Yulgarn and the cratonization. We see these low calciums in all these Archean terrains as well, and they mark the cratonization. Um, we see them in the foot walls of lower plates, in the detachments. So along the Ida Fault here, this is the UNME terrain. We see them in the centers of dome, this is Mount Margaret Dome. And we likely see them underneath us. They're probably about 5 k's below us. The other type of granite that's really, really important uh, is the mafic type, or sunukatoids. You've probably heard that word. They're quite small volumetrically, but really critical where they come in, that the location of them. They represent melts from a metasomatized mantle. They, co they commonly come with gold. Uh, there's a lot of debate about that, but there's certainly a, uh, an empirical relationship between these melts, the timing of these, and gold. And there's other granites that are less important for this story. And then the greenstones. It's been really interesting reading some of the, the literature uh, as it's evolved and uh, comparing the understanding of the Yulgarn with, say, the Superior Province in Canada. The Canadians did a really good job of their stratigraphic correlation years before we did here in Australia. But now we're, we're, I think we've caught up. And the stratigraphic work that's, that, that's done here from Maricel and others is fantastic. What it's showing is that we can correlate some of these greenstone belts across wide regions, across the whole Yulgarn. So again, that's suggesting that the Yulgarn was, uh, I guess, one entity. There was commonalities. There was uh, deeper centres and sub-basins within that. Think of greenstone belts as basins, which is what they are. Um, nevertheless, it's pretty much intact. In These are made up of volcanic rocks, um, mafic rocks, ultramafic rocks, commodiites, really weird rocks. They go through cycles, they end up more felsic, 
uh, intermediate and felsic and end up with these clastic basins. We see that pattern in all these greenstone, uh, granite greenstone belts, the Archean. It's very characteristic. You see it up in the Pilbara, in the Slave, in the Superior, etc. We have some really basic map patterns and they can tell you a lot. Okay, this is just a 2D section effect, you know, in terms of the current erosion level. And we think of where a granite's come from, come from below, it's come up to a certain level. It's sitting there juxtaposed against the greenstone that sat once at the surface. So you've got something from deep juxtaposed against something that was uh, shallow or at the surface. These are multi-phase granite cored domes. And they're in these anticlines. So the sort of basic map pattern tells us these pink rocks have to have come up. And these green rocks have to have gone down. The shear zones, the contacts between these, when we, when we, when we see them, when they're not intrusive, dip underneath the, largely dip underneath the greenstone belts. So these define a major crustal reorder. So we start off with a, with, with, with a granitic crust and a, and, 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 a, and a greenstone top. That's gravitationally unstable, doesn't like it. So we do something like that. And that's this major extension of it. We'll hear about it, and I'm sure, Sher I'm sure Sarah's going to talk about it too. What's really cool about this is that there's huge gradients across this as well, which we can map in density and gravity, but we can also map it, map it in metamorphic patterns. And I'll talk about that, probably not my best slides, but um, there's quite a lot to, to get through in that. But in terms of the temperature, the pressure of the rocks that we record either side of, and the thermal gradient, which is the, the link between the pressure and the temperature. But also just basic field stuff. You see cobbles of granite sitting in lake basins on the other side of a shear zone. This, these cobbles of granite in these basins have got to have come from the granite, right? So you're seeing this sort of reorder of the, of, of the crust. So it's, this is a major, major event. So these are, that's big picture stuff. You just see in the map patterns and just infer that from, from doing a good geology. Right, I'm going to go now and look at the, uh, a series of slices, sort of horizontal slices from the surface right down into the, into the mantle and into the, into the plate. We've got a dissected plateau, deep weathering profile, but not a huge amount of cover, at least over much of the Yulgun, the margins, yes, and a well understood regolith. Uh, the CRC Leem did some fantastic work here in Syro, doing some great work continuing on with that sort of research. I encourage you to, to read about regolith evolution. Are you airborne electromagnetic? So it's me measuring the electrical conductivity of the, of the upper crust down to about 300 metres, maybe a bit more, um, 500 metres. Excellent for mapping the cover. Uh, congratulations to GSWA and GA for doing this. It's, um, it's a fantastic data set. We can see the resistive, which is in the blue colours, Yulgarn, and these sort of coloured bits, these hi highlighted coloured bits of the paleo channels and the salt lakes. And they're also sites, interesting sites for um, potash and lithium. Uh, sorry, uranium. Can't read my lighting. There are also basement conductors in there uh, and near surface faults that we can map in these data sets. So these link into some of those other structures that we see in other data sets. But many gold deposits sit. In like, if, you, if you just get up in 3D and look at these screens and look where the deposits are, you'll see a, a, a strong correlation. Be careful with AEM, there's a lot of noise in it and, and artifacts in terms of the processing, not noise, artifacts. But uh, so it, it, it takes some uh, perseverance to understand it. Magnetics, on the other hand, we're all familiar with that. We love magnetic uh, uh, magnetics. It's been around a long time and a structural geologist, it's our, one of our go-to methods. We have magnetic and non-magnetic greenstones and granites. So they're not particularly diagnostic, but we can map structure beautifully. We can also map alteration. So don't just think of it as a structural mapping tool. Think of it as an alteration mapping tool, you know, making, mapping magnetite or destruction or pyrotite and things like that. It's all part of the alteration system. Maybe Scott spoke about that yesterday. No, you didn't. You used to. <laughs> and let's just do a little bit of a zoom in. Um, beautiful structure. Just, I just love that. Look at that. That's just great. It's great for mapping shallow structure, and I put deposits on there, but it's not really entirely clear why the deposits are exactly there. So coming back to my question, why is Kalgoorlie here? Why are we here? You know, you could ask the same question of all of those. You know, there's lots of structure. There's tons of structure. You can generate worms, you know, these, gra these magnetic gradients, and, and there's loads of them. But it's not definitive. So we really need um, other data sets to help us. Gravity, my favourite, one of my favourites, actually, I love it. And it really works really well here in the Yulgarn. We've got these dense green stones. They tend to be the reds and the yellows, a bit of the green colours, and the granites there, the, the, the bluer colours, mapped beautifully. You see the beautiful structure coming out in the, in the gravity data. Marvellous, marvellous stuff. Um, overall, the granite, uh, sorry, the Yulgarn is uh, gravity low, on a function of the large number of granites, the felsic crust, and, of course, the thick lithosphere. So again, just same idea. Just go in, look at that particular area, Deposits sit on 
often gravity gradients. So again, we can generate these gradient maps, these gravity worms, and look for, look for deposits. But I just wouldn't use those because you can see lots of gradients and there aren't deposits. Maybe they're not there because we haven't looked well, or maybe they're not there because they never were there. We've got fantastic seismic, and it was 30 years ago um, that the GA and GSWA shot the, the first big regional deep crustal seismic line. That was EGF-1, that's this guy up through here. It was a dynamite line. We learned a hell of a lot uh, about um, Archean geology and the Yulgarn in particular, and since then, a, a great investment has been made in, in acquiring reflection seismic, particularly vibrosize, across, across the, the craton. We see terrain differences, we see big structures, we map crustal penetrating shear zones, we see relationships with mineralization, and we can see bland zones, which may be alteration, maybe also processing artifacts. So again, you need to be careful with your data. So here's a view out of GA's portal. You've got, it's a 3D viewer. You can, you can load all this data up and integrate it with whatever. I know I just took a snapshot from below, looking north, the UN meter range. So just let me go back. Yeah, so that's this guy from Windermurrah outwards to, towards Leinster. And the next one will be from Leonora out to Lake Yeo through Laverton. Next two slides. And we see a highly reflective crust, especially around there, Windermurra. Um, sharp, planar, persistent moha, beautiful, beautiful data. Uh, the Ida Fault we see over here in the, in the east, we're going over to the eastern gold fields over here. And let's go further east. We're going to jump a little bit further east as we come over to Leonora, so we've lost a bit in the section. Um, compared to the you and me, it's a little different, so we are seeing these regional differences. That, that we've got a different sort of lower crust, and we've got a weaker moha, but it's still there, and we can see how the crust is thickening as we go to the east. There's a strong penetrative fabric, um, east, east dip, and we can draw fancy lines. It's annoying that this mouse doesn't work. And come up with an interpretation. And yeah, we might argue a little bit about those, but fundamentally we tend to draw the, pretty much the same lines in the same place. And uh, at the time, the paradigm at the time was that, that, that these architectures and everything about gold was associated with contraction. So we're thought full thrust belts, and I've written papers about that, which I'm probably not very proud of. Um, but that's just, you know, as you evolve your, th evolve your thoughts. Um, but we do know that gold sits there against that big, uh, at Leonora, the big penetrating shear zone at Laverton. And at the time, this was 2001, uh, Gruyere was um, Justin Osborne's twinkle in his eye, really, because 10 years after that, um, Gruyere was discovered, and they're opening up that whole gold rope, that, that belt out there in the, in, in the east, the Yamana. But these data were part of that decision-making. So this is where the big picture does matter particularly for Project Gen and where you want to go. Now, as I said, um, my ideas at the time were this was a sort of a contractional um, system, fold thrust belt, these are thrust, these sort of like thrust stacks, but Lyle Harris changed my, 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 my original thinking, started, I started to doubt myself. He was able to replicate those patterns with the centrifuge, which is all under extension. He, he replicated the, the, the rock properties that you would see of a granite greenstone belt and spun it, and you generate the same sort of things. But you can model all you like, actually, the test of this is, is what do the rocks say? And you just walk into the Sons of Gualia pit and see these amazing SC fabrics, extensional shear fabrics, clear as day, rotation of boudins and, um, and fold axes into their stretching lineation. Uh, you see beautiful fabrics that, that are imaged in the seismic and go all the way down, and that, that shear zone links up, and all that architecture was developed in that extensional event. And we'll come back to when that was. Um, so that's the, that, that's the crux. The other thing is you see SC fabrics um, at that macro scale, even in the seismic, and here's, here's it's down to three kilometres. We've got these fantastic potential field data, magnetics and, and, and gravity, and this allows us to not only make solid geology maps, but also start to draw cross sections, and you can draw serial cross sections through, through, through your area, and I recommend you do that. It's easy to draw one section and not worry about where that particular fault goes and how it interacts with something, but you test yourself by drawing it in 3D, trying to link up serial sections and then build a 3D model. That really tests your understanding of an area. The other thing is you can use the potential field data to, to um, refute that model, and, um, because there's only certain geometries that are permissible. So you might have your interpretation, you can do, that's where the forward modeling comes into it, and I'll show that in terms of that profile. So this is where our handy geophysicists are great fun to work with. We see in terms of an inversion, so it's a different approach to the data, um, that, that we have this egg carton base to the greenstone. As I said, they're mostly 5 k thick, a bit thicker up at Waluna, maybe 10. Um, there's granite cores in the cores and probably low calcium types sitting underneath these because we know they poke out in the centres of these where they're exposed. And we see these scales at mine scale. This is down at Victory, just down to the south, southwest south. 
Um, St. Ives, we see that up at Laverton, these sort of granite domes, that links up to Mount Margaret and comes down to the south down there near Burtville. And we see that at the same scale from Kalgoorlie all the way up to Waluna, these big sort of anticlinorial structures and these low angle shear zones that give these interesting patterns, possibly controlling fluid flow. Okay, these aren't the best two slides next, but I want to talk about metamorphism in terms of a piece of work that was done by Ben Goscombe. It's hardly, I don't think, used much by industry because it's in, almost impenetrable to get through, but um, it's worth persisting with. Um, there are multiple metamorphic events uh, across the whole Yulgarn over about 130 million years. There are some differences between the east and the west. As I said, it's underutilized. But the point is, you're sitting here and you've got a rock and it has a, has a um, petrogenesis, it has a metamorphic history, a PTT, what we call pressure temperature time path associated with it. And you can go and stand on another rock across a structure and find one completely different. And you can have eight kilobars between, between um, six kilobars maybe, which is 18 kilometers of difference of crustal level. That's profound. And you're seeing that in just these sorts of things, thin sections like this, right? I can't do this stuff. This is metamorphic petrology, it's, it's, but it's, it's damn good. I'm gonna draw a section through there. And again, it looks like my heart rate. Um, from the west, southwest to the, to the northeast, what it's showing is um, the temperature in red, the pressure in blue, and the thermal gradient, which is the integral of the two. And what we see when we come across those big boundaries, the picture I showed that Kev Cassidy had of those domains and terrains and things, and many of them are real, and there are big, profound differences across those boundaries. What's also interesting and, and, and worth noting is, is where those gradients are sharp, and also where we see these pressure grade, well, these, these differences, and no, no structures actually inferred. So there must be something bloody big happening between those two, two out, outcrops. It's pretty hard to see on the, on the thing, but you see these hypothetical ones. This is only one section. He's done it sections all the way through the Yulgarn. And have a look at those. I've not pursued that. I'm not working in the Yulgarn at the moment, but I recommend you do. You'll find big structures in there. How are we going for time? Oh, um, big pardon? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Good. This is, an, uh, this is an old map, 2004. A lot of stuff I'm showing is old, like me. Um, this is a classic map from Dave Champion and Kevin Cassidy. It's um, a Sumerian and Indian map. You've seen probably much more refined and, and beautified versions of it, but I really like the original. What it's reflecting is the age of the crust. And it's the separation from the mantle. So, so, so granites are melts of basalts, which are melts of the mantle, right? So when you sample the granites, you're sam sampling the age of that creation of that crust. And we can see the really old crust up in the Naria. Um, we can see the old proto-craton. We can see the Murchison looks like a rift. It's more juvenile. So the colors there, sorry, I should have said that. The red, red and hot colors are, are old and the blue colors are young or more juvenile, close to the ages of the, um, the actual emplacement ages in, in through these terrains. It looks like a rift. And these terrain differences are evident and it's, there's a primary control on deposits. So we see that gold tends to be in these more intermediate ages VM and nickel and VMS in, in these blue areas, more juvenile areas. And that all makes sense. There's also some subtle accommodation structures evident. There's, there's, going back to that sort of Francois Robert picture of the, of the gold, patchy gold distribution, there seems to be obviously a pronounced north-northwest trend to the Yulgarn, at least the eastern gold field side of it. But there's also these subtle east easterlies and east northeasterlies that many people talk about, and we've identified those before. The Proterozoic dikes utilise that architecture as well; they rip through. Okay, and we see that even in the Sumerian Neodymium data. It's not a lot of data, but it's there, and it's been shown in more subsequent uh, infill data sets that, that that's still there. So I think what we're looking at is a complex accommodation zone, which happens at any think of any passive margin. When we create that, we get accommodation zones, we get transfer faults, and things like that across arc structures. I think we're seeing that in those data. So. These fun fundamental data are telling us the big picture. Passive seismic. Uh, so this is using earthquakes, distant earthquakes. Um, most of our earthquakes come from the north and from the east and a little bit from the south. We don't get many from the west. So it's always going to be a problem here, um, thinking about where our plate position is in Australia. Nevertheless, we can generate tomographic images of the velocity structure of the lithosphere. So that's the whole plate um, and, and below. Uh, it's reflecting lithology, density, and, and, and temperature. It's a rapidly evolving field, and I know GSWA, and we'll hear about it this afternoon, are gonna be collecting more data, the WA array, and then there's the National Oz Array program. Commendable, fantastic uh, to be, to be uh, 
looked at with great glee when it comes. So the next slide is a visualization of this sort of purpley thing. It's, a it's an isosurface of a 4.8 kilometer velocity uh, slice. Okay, now we're looking down on the Yule Garden, slightly oblique tipped. This sort of browny thing, buffy thing, is about 150 k's down, so even below the Maha, way down there. Who, th who would have thought that's of any, any, any use to understand that? It's, it's very dense. It's probably eclogite, something like that, which is a residue. You, we've generated all these granites. You have to have a residue of that, a dense residue. Where's that gone? Well, maybe that's it. Maybe that peeled away. Maybe that's the delamination, that process that generated, that allowed that heat to come in to actually generate all those other melts. Who knows? Speculation. Nevertheless, there are, fe there are boundaries and features in there. Yeah, we just go back one. See the, see the Murchison up in here and this, this feature through here. So just, oops. We just simply project straight up and we look at those mantle melts. These are, the, the, these are um, things like cyanites and, uh, and lamprophires and carbonatites. We, we know come up from deep and they followed those same pathways as has gold. So we, at the time, sort of said, look, yeah, we're here. I asked, go back to the question, why are we here? Well, we're here because of big things. Um, and where are the other favorable areas? And it was interesting at the time, we speculated, let's go out there. And of course, Justin did. So could it be used for first order targeting? And I know uh, these data sets are. MT is a, is a data set that's really, uh, I guess, um, short here in, in the Yulgarn and in WA in general. And I really look forward to GSWA and GA investing more in it. And I know they are. Um, we collected this line in 20, 20, 2006. Um, what we see, uh, this is again that ISO surface. We see this conductivity bloom coming up along that edge. But importantly, in the upper crust, in that sort of golden, what we call the golden corridor between Kalgoorlie and, and, uh, and, and Waluna, we, even though this is a 2D section, we don't see all that to Luna, of course. We see this conductivity, and that's a pattern we see elsewhere, up in the Tanami, up in, the, in Northern Australia, across in Eastern Australia, there's a strong empirical relationship between the gradients of these conductivity anomalies and gold, um, at least gold. Uh, so it'd be great to see more MT in, 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 in here, and we can see the more resistive uh, UME crust. So a system is a system, a big picture really should be about a system. And what we're talking about is a, is a mineral system, actually it's an earth system. And um, what I've got here is a, it's from 2720, it's only eastern gold fields, uh, uh, and up to 2700, uh, 2600, I beg your pardon. We've got the structural history here, all the Ds, ones to million, which I you know, wrote about and stuff. Um, and don't worry about those, because these things don't happen alone, right? They're, they're integrated with the metamorphic history, with the mineralization, with the granites, and the stratigraphy. And you change one of those, you change all of them. Now let's just look at, look at this, go back to the stratigraphy. You've got this mafic, ultra mafic going up into the sort of more intermediate, interfelsic, and then we get late basins. We look at the granites. We have these big bloom of, low, of, of um, high calcium granites. We switch over after the late basins to these low calcium granites over here. At that switch over, we get these mafic granites and cyanites, these sinucatoids, they're coming in at that time. That's when we get a big kick in gold. We have earlier gold, more, more data's come through. We get a massive change in metamorphism. We get huge thermal gradients. We get these really weird anti-clockwise PTT parts. And we get massive extension. We saw those extensional shear zones. That's the reordering. That's what really set that, set that architecture that we see up in the seismic. So how can we use that um, in a pr practical way. So these are big picture arm wavy things, you know, going back to Cam's diagram. You know, so we have a, a pretty good process understanding, uh, conceptual understanding. We've got some practical information, 3D maps and so on, and we can put all that together in terms of endowment and start generating heat maps of, of, of those. And you know, this is a talk in itself. Um, and, and mapping chemistry onto, on, onto those other parts of the system. What this thing lacks is time, but um, as in timing. Nevertheless, we can come back to that question I posed to you right at the start, you know, why are we here? Well, we're here for all those convergence of all those re reasons and you know, the Kalgoorlie, here we are sitting here in that whole belt. Deposits were not put into this analysis, this was just the process understanding and mapping those proxies to that process and putting it together it's simply in a GIS and generating these sorts of heat maps. This is 15 years old, this stuff. Um, but it's effectively discovered the, 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 the main camps and it found a lot of other interesting areas. But I guess it gave us cons confidence about the process. So the, the big picture really matters if you want to understand and you want to predict. Really important for those in Project Gen, but also if you're sitting on a rig as well, understanding why you, why you are where you are and what you can feed back into your Project Gen teams. 
So you need to be able to integrate from the data poor to the data um, downscale and integrate from the data rich from your deposit area upscale. Both those conceptual and, and empirical processes are really important. Keep an open mind. My, my, my thoughts and ideas have changed over the 30, well, 25 years I've been working on the Yulgarn. Um, read heaps, most importantly, observe, map, and record. Ask yourself, why am I here? And I mean, the deposit, you know, why are you here, as opposed to somewhere else. Okay, and, and if someone sent you over there, ask yourself, why are they, why are they sending you there? Okay, and I, final, final message. I'm, I'm 31 years in the Geological Survey in GA, and I think <clears throat> GA is fantastic. I think what the work they do, a um, bit biased, I know, and I think what GSWA do are fantastic. I've been, I've seen a lot of global uh, geological surveys, and the surveys here in Australia and here in, GSW, in, in Western Australia, world class. We are bloody lucky to have what we have here. I know now as I'm an explorer myself and a consultant, the data sets are just awesome and the people and the knowledge is amazing. So tell the ministers, because you can't take it for granted, trust me. I'd like to acknowledge hundreds of people I've worked with over the years. For further reading, behind paywalls, don't, uh, this will be available for you. Not behind paywalls. Some of these are quite old, but that's okay. They're still valid, so thanks very much.